Can I have your attention, please? Please do take your seats. Thank you, everyone, for coming this evening to the Oxford Martin School. Uh, my name is Cameron Hepburn. I'm the director of the Smith School of Enterprise and the Environment, and uh, one of the various directors of Oxford Martin School programs, including at the Institute for New Economic Thinking. And it's my pleasure, a real pleasure today, uh, to welcome Jeremy Hynans to Oxford. Uh, Jeremy is not a completely unfamiliar face in these parts, having uh, started some education here sometime in the past, but he's known as being the extremely successful co-founder and chief executive officer of Purpose, which is a global organization based in New York that builds movements. So if anybody knows about people power, uh, it's Jeremy. He also co-founded two uh, successful digital movements, Get Up in Australia, which has had a transformative effect uh, on, on the Australian political landscape, and Avaaz, which I believe is the largest uh, membership organization, online membership organization in the world with 65 million members. Um, so it's quite an impressive record. Uh, he's the author of the best-selling book, New Power, shortlisted by the FT as one of their business books of the year, and has won a trillion different awards, which if I was here listing them all out, we'd all be, he'd be embarrassed and we would never actually get to hear his talk. But I would just say, um, the Fast Company Most Creative Person in Business Award is one of them. And uh, other things that have been said about Jeremy, uh, well, wide, various, broad ranging, but possibly uh, the most interesting is that there's a quote, something like, he might be the most influential Australian in the world. <laughs> so that obviously tops it off if you're Australian as I am. So Jeremy. <laughs> Please, uh, we're delighted to have you today to talk about new power and with a bit of a focus on climate change and environment. Um, those of you online, I hope you're tuning in and can hear all okay. Do uh, post your questions in the chat function. We have uh, Kaya on hand here to make sure that they'll be fed through. And, um, and those of you in the audience, enjoy the talk. And I'm particularly looking forward to the Q&A. So have your questions ready. Jeremy, welcome, thank you. Thank, thank you so much, Cameron. And, uh, you know, the, the most influential Australian of the Year thing is, uh, is both an insult to you um, and, more importantly, an insult to Kylie Minogue, I think. Um, but, um, but it's really fantastic to be here. As, as Cam mentioned, I, um, I did have a, a short but glorious stint here at Oxford um, uh, where I started a, a PhD way back in the day. Um, and so I have a very fond memories and it's really lovely to be back. And i um, really excited to sort of share some thinking with you today. And um, I will try to keep my remarks short enough that we have time for a really robust conversation um, afterwards. So um, we're gonna get started. And so we're gonna start with, um, with a, a journey back deep into my childhood. Um, as a child activist, because part of what we're going to talk about today is how the world of movement building has changed and on climate change, you know, what, what I think the path forward might be. So, so we have to go back to, to the dark ages, to my early career as an activist. So this was me as a 12 year old. Today, we spoke to Jeremy Hyman's at his Sydney home. I think we have got problems, and I think we have got monetary problems. Uh, what you could do is divert 10% of each nation's annual military spending to services of debt, the environment, and, you know, health, malnutrition, children, and all these problems because we spend an excessive amount, an enormous amount on the military, which is completely uh, unnecessary to spend so much. And instead, we've got to spend that money on immediate problems, problems that uh, endanger our uh, entire society. So as a super normal child, as you can tell, totally normal. Um, and as a, as a child, I'm going to get out from behind the lectern, um, out from a, uh, you know, I had this bizarre career as a child activist. I was lucky enough to travel around the world and meet different world leaders and Nobel Prize winners and, and campaigning uh, for, among other things, what was then called the greenhouse effect, uh, which of course then became uh, what we now think of as climate change. 
And the weapon of my activism as a, as a kid was the mighty fax machine, right? So this was the, um, this was the tool of, of my activism. Uh, there were some particularly unsuccessful campaigns. Um, the, the best one that uh, I've told the story a few times before is when I tried to stop the first Gulf War um, by asking people, I got on the radio in Australia, because there was obviously no internet yet, uh, and I got on the radio and I said to everybody, please flood the fax machine at the Intercontinental Hotel in Geneva, where James Baker and Tarek Aziz were meeting on the eve of the first Gulf War. Flood the fax machine at the Intercontinental in Geneva with faxes, telling them not to go to war. And obviously there's a bit of a bandwidth constraint with a fax, um, and that campaign was not, was not particularly successful. Many of my campaigns were not, but obviously, you know, today, a much, much more successful archetype um, is Greta. And, you know, <laughs> other than the fact that Greta is clearly abundantly more skillful than I ever was, she's also got these extraordinary tools at her disposal. And what's so interesting about the Greta story is Greta was able to start in this hyper-local way. And she starts as this campaigner in, you know, in Sweden, um, in her own school. And that um, does really grow into this profound highly decentralized movement, right? It's not a movement that Greta is the puppet master of. She doesn't sit there and, and give orders, right? But her example has inspired, inspired this extraordinary decentralized movement where many, many leaders emerged. And hold that thought because it's, I think, instructive um, to a lot of the dynamics that we're going to be talking about today. So this is a strange slide transition because we're going to go from Greta Thunberg to Harvey Weinstein. Um, but, um, but I want to kind of talk to you a little bit about this idea of uh, how power is shifting. And in order to do that, you have to start with an exemplar of a very, very, very uh, old and archetypal form of power, right? Think about the way that Harvey Weinstein wielded power. So this was a guy who was like absolutely atop the heap in Hollywood. He was, um, you know, he, he was so powerful at the beginning of our book when we told this story, we pointed out that there was a survey taken of the people most thanked in the Academy Awards over the last 30 years. And when people get up and they, they receive their Oscar and tied for first place with Harvey Weinstein was God, right? So that's, that's how powerful he was. He used that power like a currency, right? The kind of power that you use to reward his friends and his protectors and to punish his enemies. And as a result, you have this remarkable phenomenon, which is everyone in, in Hollywood knew he was an abuser, right? Uh, but even the most powerful men in Hollywood did not stand up to this man, right? And then you contrast the kind of power that Harvey wielded so effectively to do so much harm with the power of this movement that emerged that was part of how Harvey Weinstein was toppled, right? So the Me Too movement doesn't work the same way. If Harvey's power is power as currency, then the Me Too movement is power that works more like a current, right? It's like a surge of energy. It gets more powerful the more people participate. But also like a current, you can't really control it in that same way, right? So it's not something you can hoard up. So it's a form of energy. And with the Me Too movement, it was instigated by a woman um, called Tarana Burke uh, more than a decade before it went absolutely global, right? And exploded everywhere. Um, and it became this cacophony of testimonies, right? Where one person's testimony made the next person's testimony easier. And that collective action effect unlocked a lot of social and cultural change. And it did it not through one leader calling the shots again, but through all of these different leaders that emerged. And as the Me Too movement developed, it also changed, right? That was one of the interesting characteristics of it. So in each country that it went, it evolved and adapted itself to the local context, right? So in France, it became, uh, it became denounce your pig because the French like to be a little bit more direct about these things. Um, in Brazil, right, the phenomenon of this kind of abuse was so common in the lives of women that they reframed the movement to be my first assault where people would tell the story of their first assault. And it also, of course, in each, in each industry took shape, right, and brought about a lot of change. So here's another example of the sort of um, the, the, the oppositions of our moment, right? We're obviously all living through the, um, 
the worst global health situation um, of our lifetimes. And um, it's funny because in the lead up in 2019, before COVID, um, uh, I co-authored an article in the British Medical Journal talking about the phenomenon of anti-vaxxers and how anti-vaxxers were organized and why they were so dangerous. And little do we know that we'd be in this um, epic battle right, right now between kind of two very different sets of forces. So on the one hand, you've got the public health institutions, right, that are, you know, doing their best with um, to communicate science and expertise um, uh, in a very rapidly evolving environment, right? It's not a static information environment. It's just really um, all over the place information environment. And they've got their channels to do that and they've got their ways to do it. But those ways are not particularly compatible with the ways that ideas spread today, which is a big dynamic that we'll talk about. And in contrast, you have these anti-vaxxers and, and various vaccine hesitant people who don't have their hands on the institutional authority, they don't have the bully pulpit, um, even necessarily in the mainstream media, um, except in Fox, Fox News, um, but mostly don't have mainstream media behind them. They mostly don't have, um, they mostly don't have uh, the channels to reach people at scale. But what they do have is this really powerful community and an incredible facility at spreading their ideas sideways online, right? And we've done a lot of um, studying of um, one of the big things that um, Purpose is working on right now is countering COVID vaccine misinformation. And it's really remarkable when you study how it spreads, who spreads it. It doesn't take that many people to initially propagate the misinformation. For that information then um, to travel person to person, your crazy uncle sends that message to 25 people on WhatsApp and that message goes. And those small, not particularly powerful people have had a really big impact on overall public health outcomes in this pandemic and are preventing us in many countries from reaching key thresholds of vaccination. So what do you do in an environment like that when that is the kind of the balance and the battle that's happening? So these examples that I've just given you, right? Um, you know, the, 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 the titan of industry, Harvey Weinstein is toppled by this movement. These anti-vaxxers jousting with public health authorities are really examples of this dynamic that we call the um, the distinction between old power and new power. So again, to come back to this analogy, old power, power as currency. The more of it you have, the more powerful you are. It's based on what you know, what you own, what you control that others don't. New power though, power is current. You can't quite uh, hoard it, but you can harness its energy. And a lot of what we'll talk about today is how to do that, like what the method is to do that. It's made by many, it uploads, it shares, it tends to thrive in environments that are open, not closed. Old power tends to be you know, much more familiar to all of us, right? Most of our institutions are built on a bedrock of old power. It downloads, it commands, and it tends to work better in ecosystems that are closed or proprietary. So here's another way to think about the difference between old and new power. Um, is there, who, remembers, who remembers this, all right? Everybody who's old in the room, put up their hand. Um, so this, including me, this is Tetris, right? The most popular video game of the 20th century. And you think about Tetris for a moment as a metaphor for old power, right? These blocks are falling on your head. Your job is to sort them out into neat rows. The blocks get faster and faster and faster until they eventually overwhelm you. So it's a single player game. It's you versus the system. The system ultimately has much more power and agency than you do. And you have to play by these very um, limited rules. Um, who knows what this is? Minecraft. There was a whisper, a whisper there. Minecraft is the most popular video game of the 21st century. And like Tetris, it's block based, right? So the, the, the unit is the same. But in all other respects, it's, it's a great metaphor for new power because Minecraft um, is a multiplayer game, not a single player game. Everything in Minecraft is built from the bottom up by its users. Um, there are really no rules that constrain what you can do. You'll find in this, in this world, whole worlds kind of real and imagined. So much of the physical world is reproduced in Minecraft. And then all of this other, um, all this other stuff is imagined and created. Um, and the, the logic of the game, the way you get ahead in this game is you build things with other people right, you collaborate. So imagine if you're a kid today, you know, 
the, the kids of a certain generation, um, you know, in the Tetris world um, were, you know, were playing Tetris. Now, if you're playing Minecraft all day, what's going to be different about how you think about your level of agency, your expectations around how you get to shape the world, right? The connections between you and institutions. And then you see this sort of dichotomy that, that we talk about between what we call old power and new power values. And we see this playing out in the world today in lots of different ways, right? And I'll start to connect this to climate. We're going to talk more about climate in a, in a moment. But you think about, um, you know, governance, right? So I think a lot of the old power world and the old power mindset is built on notions of kind of formal representative governance. And it's at this point that I want to point out something quite important about our argument here. Our argument is not, you know, new power good, old power bad, right? And if you note, I've already given you some examples of some very negative applications of new power. Really, this is these are two kind of methods and mindsets for exercising power. And you could, you know, quite um, justifiably position yourself on either side of the ledger on different um, issues and in different contexts. So in governance, you know, you see that old power tends to be more representative in some ways. It's more formal, it's more representative. You might think of um, in the climate context, um, the UN climate process as being a, a, a great example of a um, you know, of, of a sort of old power process, right? It's very inclusive. Everybody has a voice at the table. Um, but of course, historically over these 26 COPs, you could argue it hasn't been you know, hugely effective. You, you might think there's an interesting difference we were talking about in an earlier session I did with some students at the Smith School today between um, the Paris COP and the Copenhagen COP that, that is a bit instructive about how the world is shifting. In the Copenhagen COP, they were still in the paradigm of trying to get a kind of binding global agreement, right? That was kind of a top-down architecture that would create governance that would, um, that would address the climate crisis. And by the time of the Paris Agreement, um, that had already broken down, right? That had failed at Copenhagen. And for Paris, you know, Christiana Figueres, who was in charge of that process, decided, you know what, I'm going to do this from the bottom up more. I'm going to, I'm not going to try to get a binding agreement. That's not going to, in the sense of a, a treaty type instrument or, you know, big global agreements that work that way. I'm going to get national level commitments that are going to kind of add up to something, um, add up to something bigger. And we can talk a bit more about, about where the, that process is headed um, later. You know, you've got this dynamic between collaboration, crowd wisdom, sharing as kind of norms ends in themselves and competition, exclusivity, resource consolidation, all that kind of stuff, right? You think about a Donald Trump as an embodiment of an old power mindset, right? When it comes to things like that, he saw the world as a world of winners and losers. Um, transparency, right? And the separation between public and private. In many organizations now, um, transparency is becoming a kind of a norm and a mantra, right? Every organization is committing to various forms of transparency and a lot of them are not actually doing it. But, um, but there's an increasing expectation, right, among those who hold some of these new power values that um, institutions should be transparent, right? In my organization, there have been um, uh, people asking for everyone's salary to be made public, right, or to be made transparent to the, to the organization. Um, we talk about this a lot in our work and in, in our book, you know, these interesting dynamics around how you do transparency is a particularly funny example of this in, in the book that we wrote of a politician in Arizona who was running for governor of Arizona. And he'd had a particularly colorful um, sort of personal and sexual history. And um, he decided that instead of allowing that to be revealed as a scandal, right, um, uh, as a secret that was revealed, that he would just publish on his own website an extensive list of all of the things that he'd done, right? And it was really disarming. And it, it, you know, in a sense, it was quite effective because there could never be a scandal if he published. There have been videos, there have been groups. It was all consensual, you know, but it was very not politician-like. And, and in, in doing so, he, um, he disarmed, right? And in, in a sense, that mindset and that approach is a lot of how people are now living in the discourse and social media, um, particularly younger people are exposing vastly more of their, of their lives publicly and living in that boundary very differently. Um, expertise 
right? I think this is hugely relevant to debates on climate change, where so much of where we've gotten stuck has been um, experts believing that um, the facts, that if only we can get the facts out, right, if only experts um, can, um, you know, can be listened to, right, we can win on an issue like climate change. And what we've learned time and time again is that expertise in and of itself is not enough in this environment where norms around expertise are being challenged and dissolved. Like we remember with the Brexit debate, how um, effective that attack on expertise was, right? Oh, you know, literally people said things like, we've had enough of experts, right? Stop listening to the economists, um, start following your guts. And that dynamic, right, where experts are sort of attacked uh, and undermined, doesn't mean that experts should step back. It means they actually need to step forward in a different way and embrace some of the new power tools that we're going to be talking about today. Um, and finally, you know, affiliation. So, you know, in the 20th century, lots of organizations, you know, people's affiliation and connection to them, whether it be an institution like Oxford that they might have stayed at for 40 or 50 years or an organization that they would have had a card in their wallet um, um, showing that they were members of, of that organization, those notions of affiliation have changed. They're, they tend, we tend to, we're in a world now where people tend to be more affiliative, right? We're joining things, we're opting into them online, we're participating, but they we tend to do that in a way that is more transient, right? That is more, um, that is, that is more opt-in. And so if you're an institution or if you're a movement, you need to adapt the way you engage with people to account for those changes. So um, we first we first did this thinking, we published it in Harvard Business Review. And if you ever read a, a Harvard Business Review article, they're not usually hugely exciting. They all um, require one of these two by two matrices. It's like in the contract, you must make up one of these. So this, this was the, the, um, the two by two that we developed. And, and what this compass does is it tries to map organizations um, and movements in the world today along two dimensions. So on the horizontal axis, you have the values of the organization. Do the values of the organization track more to the left side of the column here or to the right? Um, the mindset, if you like, the behaviors. And then on the vertical axis, you have the model. Does the model of the organization, the core operating model, rely more on what you might think of as Tetris dynamics, right? capture control top down uh, exclusivity or do they rely more on uh, minecraft dynamics participatory upload collaboration what's the kind of fuel of the model so um let's take a little tour of this of this compass and then we can can maybe think about where you think oxford um fits on the uh, on the framework um so i knew that would get a little giggle um, so uh, bottom left, the castles, the castles, the castles are the models, which, you know, the old, old, right? Um, most of our social institutions are still here. M many of them are having trouble in this new environment, but not all of them. I think, interestingly, you might think Apple, why is Apple in this quadrant? Apple is a technology company. I think one of the reasons that we, we want to point this out is that, you know, we shouldn't conflate the use of technology, even of social media effectively, with new power, because it's possible to still talk at people, right, and talk, you know, download at people um, with technology. You think about Apple as a company, right, its business model is based on the idea that there's a product designer in California who knows what we need before we know we need it, and then every year the new iPhone kind of descends from the heavens and we, we buy it whatever they've done to it, we buy it. And then, you know, you notice the Apple stores around the world, the, the, the location of the Apple um, uh, logo is actually where the crucifix is in a church. So we really are asked to worship Apple. That's our relationship with Apple, right? It is not a participatory brand. It's a brand that's about admiration and worship. And it's culturally, you know, as a company on the values known as being extremely secretive and extremely uncollaborative, right? And yet, it is, you know, by some measures, the most valuable company in the world. So you can still have some successful strategies in the in the in the castles quadrant, but most most players can't be Apple. And then you move to the bottom right, the cheerleaders. So these tend to be old power institutions in transition. 
So, you know, a good example might be the Guardian, right? So the Guardian's core model is still old power, right? A bunch of journalists write things, we read them. It's mostly about them downloading and us and us consuming. Um, but it's making some really, it's made some really interesting changes over the last decade to its model, right? It's sort of shifted from a, um, a subscriber model to what they call a member model. At least for a period, they were really engaging with this idea that how can we make the people who read the newspaper participants in the mission of the newspaper? Can they contribute to our research? Can they be activists on behalf of the values that we represent? Um, can they be involved, right, in a different way? Is the power relationship different? Um, and they've obviously embraced a lot of new power values like radical transparency in, 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 their, in their own journalism. Top right quadrant um, are the crowds, right? New power values, new power models. And I think there are two archetypes worth distinguishing here. So in the top right, you've got um, the models that are not institutions at all, right? A Me Too, a Black Lives Matter. Um, these are not institutions where you can knock on the door and say, I want to speak to the head of Black Lives Matter, please, right? Um, uh, because they're, they're organizations where there are multiple leaders and they're highly decentralized and by their nature, and, and that's the source of their power, right? But it's also what makes um, makes them so confounding um, for institutions, because institutions don't really know how to partner with them or engage with them um, um, because they're, they're movements. And so then you've got archetypes like a Wikipedia, which are more institutionalized, right? But their lifeblood is very much based on this the, the mass participation of the editors and the and the and the people who um, engage with that with that content. The opportunity for institutions in engaging with movements like Black Lives Matter is how do you ally with them effectively? What does that skill set look like if you're a more of an old power organization, but you're pursuing common goals? And that's some of the work we do at Purpose is actually that kind of work. When we're sitting at the intersection of the activists um, um, who are sort of deinstitutionalized and, and, and decentralized and the institutions, like in the US context, it would be an organization like the ACLU, which is a big civil rights, civil liberties organization that has the lawyers, the expertise to, to create policy change, um, but doesn't know necessarily yet how to create the kind of energy that a movement um, um, like Black Lives Matter can create on criminal justice reform, for example. And then we have the co-opters, the top left. And these are really the most interesting characters in the world today, in my view. So these are the characters that are um, uh, new power models, but old power values. So these are, these are actors that have used new power to get to scale, right? They've used the network effects. You think about a Facebook, that's a classic new power model, clearly, right? We're all uploading, we're all participating. Um, that's the model. Without that, it would be an empty shell. Um, and yet, and they use that incredibly effectively to get to scale. And yet, as we all know, Facebook took that and then really locked down um, with some very old power values. So our power relationship with Facebook is we don't control or have any say in the algorithm that we now know can shape our thoughts, our opinions, um, our feelings on a daily basis. We have no share in the economic value they create, even though it's our kind of labor, our content that is driving that. Um, and we have no say in its governance. Um, despite the fact that this has become almost as important as a government um, in terms of the implications that it has for democracy. So, you know, that, 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 that's why we call in the book Facebook a participation farm, because they're really harvesting our participatory energies in a way that is profoundly extractive. Um, so the cultures are interesting because they're harnessing a lot of the benefits of, all, of new power um, but they're, um, they're also very dangerous because um, they're, they're locking down um, with a lot of old power. And they're also vulnerable. So we're living through that now, right, with Facebook. Facebook is both um, uh, incredibly powerful, but also incredibly vulnerable um, because if its own users begin to desert it, um, you know, it, it, is, it, it is potentially a house of cards. So um, no time to do this now, but um, homework, um, sit with, with your own team, with the organization that you're closest to, if it's Oxford, your bit of Oxford, and think about where, A, think about where you fit on this framework today, 
And also think about where you want to be in five years' time. Like, what is the direction of travel? And we've had these conversations with lots of people and institutions and um, in very unusual and interesting contexts from, like, you know, the leaders of the UN agencies to corporate types. And we get really interesting conversations that, that come about. So, um, so yeah, um, maybe, maybe while we have everybody, we can do a quick show of hands. Where does Oxford fit, do we think, right now in this framework. I'll just, I'll just read it out here. Is Oxford a crowd? Is Oxford a cheerleader? Is Oxford a castle? Yes. Okay, some strong castle vibes. And is Oxford a wily co-opter? Probably not. Um, okay, okay, cool. And where, where do we think Oxford should be? Because the answer is not always for Oxford to be, um, you know, over there, it's not going to be, uh, you know, Occupy Wall Street, right? Um, so, do do people have a sense of where Oxford should be? What what's the right combination of um, of old and, and new power? Do we think is it a should it stay a castle? Who thinks it should stay a castle? Who thinks it should be a cheerleader? Okay, lots of cheerleader energy. Who think it should move into the crowd's quadrant? And who thinks it should become a co-opter? Okay. All right. So the the pattern is clear. We think we we think we want to move from castle to cheerleader. Um, interesting. All right. So we're going to unpack some implications of this now, and in a moment we'll be speaking specifically about the climate context, and um, and hopefully that'll also be a lot of what we talk about in our Q and A. So you know the first um, lesson is really that the battle, uh, the future is going to be a battle over who can mobilize best. I think, um, which is not necessarily a great thing. You know, I, I'm not saying that um, saying that with any um, great enthusiasm, but I do think that so much of the skill set that will determine um, which ideas win, which um, sources of power win, which institutions win, is going to be um, is going to be this capacity to deploy new power, right? And of course, we live this on on climate, right? And in much the way that I was describing the battle between anti-vaxxers and um, public health authorities. We've, of course, also, um, you know, fought that battle on climate, right? And the the climate scientists um, that are so, you know, um, are powerful and effective and have so much moral force, but don't necessarily inherently, they're not trained to communicate that science, right? Um, and that's been really interesting. I was talking um, earlier today about a campaign that we're running at Purpose on COVID, that, um, that sort of maybe points the way to something interesting here. And this is a campaign where we went and we, um, we realized in the research that doctors and scientists still had a ton of credibility and authority with a lot of important audiences on COVID. And we were trying to figure out how to get people comfortable taking COVID vaccines. And so we went to all of the different labs around the world that were developing COVID vaccines. This was a little in advance of when the vaccines became available, but when we knew that we would need to do like a lot of campaigning um, and communications to get people to take the vaccine, right? We, we knew that the anti-vax problem was gonna be real. So what we did is we went and we recruited kind of charismatic scientists, um, people that were working in these labs and we, we kind of interviewed a bunch of people and we figured out who, was, who had potential to be a really compelling communicator on, on the vaccine. And so we created something called Team Halo. And Team Halo was this model where we basically took those scientists and we um, trained them in how to use TikTok. And we specifically chose TikTok because even though not everybody's on TikTok, like TikTok is where a lot of the most viral content on the internet now originates. So we trained them um, to use TikTok to create these really compelling self-shot videos um, that, that are kind of funny and human and engaging and participatory about COVID vaccines. And that strategy is now um, proliferated. So we have a hundred of these kind of personalities who have now got following some of them in the millions. And we've had hundreds of millions of engagements with the content um, and it really performs. We even did some, um, some trials where you know, where we showed that particularly for young people, but for all age groups, people who were exposed to this content became much more likely to take a COVID vaccine. And we compared that to traditional public health communications, which literally had no effect on people's willingness to take a COVID vaccine. So imagine that on climate, right? Imagine what we could do if we more intentionally um, uh, engaged 
um, the voices that do have authority and credibility, those experts, but in a way um, that humanized them and the issue. Um, in the environment that we're in now, though, one of the challenges for climate is that um, we live in a world where the currency of things that break through are things that have intensity behind them. And one of the challenges on the issue of climate change is even though climate change is the biggest issue in the world, right, by most rational measures, and is certainly, you know, um, <laughs> you know, certainly a huge crisis, it actually lacks the qualities of intensity that some other issues have that enable them to create bigger, more intense movements, right? And, and there's a few different qualities to intensity. So one thing with intensity is, you know, things that are personal, that are about identity, tend to attract a lot of intensity, right? You can relate to them. So you think about the issue of um, LGBT rights and gay marriage and all of that, that was an incredibly quick sea change. And there are lots of different reasons for that, right? One reason was there were no economic interests lined up against change on that issue the way there are in climate, no doubt. But another reason is that like that issue came alive because people came out. They came out to their families. They started coming out in more and more um, numbers and that, process right um, meant that you had a deeply personal connection to the issue that you could embody it so you know in the way that you could look on an issue like gay rights and think well my son is gay or this person in my life is gay you can't do that on climate in the same way you can't even though it is true that people are differentially affected by climate you, you know you don't think there's a person in my life that's really going to be affected by climate change in the same way you think about it generically as your kids but that is very very different and so um, intensity around climate is going to mean attaching the issue to other issues that have more of those kind of personal qualities that connect more directly to people's lives. Um, and the challenge always with intensity is intensity comes a little bit at the cost of cool, rational, fact-based communication, right? So the cool, rational, fact-based communication tends to be in the favorability bucket, not the intensity bucket. So one of the challenges is how do we communicate the truth, science, reason, but in a way that actually gathers intensity. And what we found over time in our work at Purpose is that the most effective strategies don't tend to be an extreme of old power or new power, but they tend to be really effective combinations of the two. So to take a different issue, um, the issue of gun violence in America, right? So one of our, the big things that we've done over the years at Purpose was we, we were um, asked to help create a new organization to really take on the NRA in the US. So as those of you know, the NRA incredibly powerful. And what's, what's really clever about the NRA's model is they blend old and new power. So on the one hand, they've got this very fearsome old power brand. Politicians in America will literally, and we literally in our book talked about an example of a politician who resigned preemptively simply because she knew that the NRA were going to run a campaign against her, right? Um, they've created this aura of being incredibly powerful, even though, parenthetically, I'll note, the data does not support this necessarily. They're not as effective in elections as they appear to be. But everybody thinks they're really effective. They've got lots of money. Um, and, of course, they also have a really sophisticated new power skill set. And one of the things when we really dug into the NRA that we found fascinating is it wasn't just the... Um, it wasn't just the fact they had a membership of 4 million Americans um, who paid these dues and believed. They also were really good at letting a thousand flowers bloom. So there's this whole ecosystem of gun clubs and activist groups and blogs and shops selling gun paraphernalia. And they give these little micro grants to these different groups and they look at the landscape and they see whether there's an activist running an idea that might be even further to the right of what they're running. And then what they do is when they see that getting traction, they throw jet fuel on it and they amplify it. And we and that is again and again how they win. So they have an understanding that in order to cultivate intensity, you need this whole ecosystem of players and um, you need to also not always be in control, right? You need to actually be able to allow those elements to percolate and then just come in and amplify. So there's a lot of work and nuance around how you combine the old and the new power, we created an organization called Every Town that I think has really helped to move the needle um, somewhat in the US. Really hard issue, but it sort of reframed the gun issue from um, 
gun control, which was not a winning message in America, to kind of gun safety and centering women in particular and mothers who had this really deep personal connection to the issue, who had some of the uh, intensity that matched the intensity of those gun rights supporters. Um, and then I talked about our COVID work um, a moment ago. So on climate, I want to tell you two stories, really, of, of, of types of campaigns that we've run um, that I think are, are instructive on the way forward. And I, I will say, you know, obviously incredibly, incredibly hard. There is no magic solution to the challenge of how we mobilize the world on climate. And about every three weeks, some usually um, rich guy will come into my office in New York or used to when we, we had, you know, more, more in-person things and would say, I've got a lot of money and I'm like, I've figured it out. We just have to tell people how important this is. And, you know, like I'm going to run this campaign and you're like, okay. Um, but, you know, it's really, really hard. So I do want to start by saying, I'm going to give you some examples that I, I think are going to hopefully be, um, be hopeful, but acknowledging and holding the fact that this remains an incredibly difficult issue. So, um, so you know, the first thing to think about effective climate campaigns is to really understand that, um, we are not all the same, which, by the way, is, is, is seems really obvious, but is actually most climate campaigning completely ignores this, right? So this is from some work done by More in Common, which is an organization that back in the day, Purpose was involved in incubating, and Tim Dixon, who's here today, is one of the founders of it, um, and they've done some of the best research and, and work in the world at really segmenting different populations and understanding their underlying values and psychographics rather than just like their positions on issues. Because their positions on issues are actually a lot less predictive um, of their political behavior. And so this is a particular cut of the UK's population um, based on this really detailed psychographic research, um, which basically buckets the UK population um, in, these, um, in these six categories. Um, and uh, you know, any guesses on which category almost all climate campaigns end up most being targeted to? Any guesses? Progressive activists, right? 13% of the population. But why is that? Because all the people in the environmental organizations are progressive activists. And not in a bad way, but they're all like really earnestly um, using arguments that are incredibly motivating to them right, that they really believe in. Um, but um, it turns out that if you're engaging a loyal national or a, or, or a backbone conservative or a disengaged traditionalist, those entry points are not going to work well at all. The same moral arguments that might move a progressive activist to tears might actually alienate somebody who um, might be very motivated in a very different way by concepts of stewardship, um, of nature, um, who want to hear a totally different set of arguments um, and language. So that has informed a lot of our work at, at Purpose, that philosophy. And so most of the work we do at Purpose is not focused on the progressive activists, right? Um, it's actually focused on um, much more difficult to reach audiences, but the audiences that you actually need to win. And the way we organize that work is through a lab. Um, so basically the way Purpose is organized is in these thematic labs on different issues. And we have a big lab on climate change which has about 50 people working full-time just on climate around the world. Um, so some of the examples that I'll share with you come from that. But before we get into some of the more serious examples, I wanna share this more fun example, but it will connect to the argument I'm about to make, um, which is a video we made some years ago. And this was an unusual request that we had, which was that um, we, we got an outreach from the Vatican. Um, and uh, the Vatican were like, listen, we have this, um, have this uh, papal encyclical coming out, right? And this is this is like these encyclicals are really rare and they're a very big deal. And there was finally an encyclical on climate change, and they were like, "How do we make this interesting to everybody else?" Because you know, until the last one, I think it was, all the papal encyclicals were published in Latin. So yeah, these were not super accessible initially, right? I mean, they were translated, obviously, but like that's the kind of vibe, right? And so, um, and so. Um, they said, okay, we want to make a big splash for the encyclical and we want to reach a mainstream audience. Um, uh, and so we made this video, which I will. Oh, here it is. He is a gentle man, a holy man. 
agency. But what will he do when God's lovingly created planet comes under attack? If we destroy creation, creation will destroy us. Time to take out the trash. A time of fighting for God's creation. Come on, you homies. Tireless. Fearless. This hope must be stopped. Coal, oil, gas. These are God-given gifts. And they are ours for the taking. Unstoppable. Help me, Father. Nature never forgives. If you slap it, it will always slap you back. He is an easy man to follow and a hard man to silence. But in this epic battle against climate crisis, we can't let him fight alone. This summer, to save our world, one man... Come on, Francis. ...will risk it all. Power of me compels you. To change everything, we need everyone. Coming to Earth this June. So, so, um, so it was very funny when we cast this um, ad in our office. Like, what, I was like, why is why are there like eleven people who look like Jesus in uh, lined up? In, it was very, it was very funny. So, in 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 practice, this video was really about. Um, um, this interesting segment that we called the Pope is dope crowd. These were not. This was not targeted at religious Catholics. Um, uh, to be clear, it was actually targeted at the people who could influence the mainstream media narrative. Um, more at the top of the segment, um, but it turned out there was this very influential group of people who were progressive, who were secular, but who really admired the Pope. Some of them were religious, but they were not like super devout. Um, but they actually had a lot of sway and. Um, making a cultural moment out of the Pope's uh, encyclical was, was quite an effective strategy. But I want to talk to you about um, a strategy that was um, a little less fun, but I think a lot more impactful, which was a bunch of work we've done around engaging Catholics in Poland. And so this, this story is really kind of classic example of the kind of work that we've been doing on climate. And I do think it points the way. So um, Poland is a really tough country to do work on climate in, right? So there's a very conservative um, law and justice party, very right-wing government. Um, there is a nexus in Poland of power where the Catholic church is incredibly powerful. The coal industry has kind of mythical status in the country. Remember the kind of solidarity links as well. Like the, the coal industry has a kind of national heartland connection. Uh, and, um, and, and so, the combination of a right-wing government, a coal industry that's very powerful, a Catholic church, all of whom are intertwined, right, in, in quite important ways. So we, um, we knew that um, this was challenging because Poland has been a blocker in a lot of European climate negotiations, and in 2018, Poland was due to host the COP, right? So when they held the presidency of the COP, this was kind of a difficult one because there was a real risk that that COP was going to be um, held up if there was no... Um, you know, political wins um, for climate in Poland at that time. So we ended up doing a whole bunch of work that was similar to the work I showed you earlier in the UK um, to really get deep into the Polish population and similarly segmented that population in lots of ways. And there were various groups that were more a small, you know, there were progressives and there were moderates, but the group that it was overwhelmingly clear we needed to reach were small C conservative, Catholics, right? The voting base of the Law and Justice Party. Um, so, you know, right wing, traditional, um, um, religious Catholics. And the challenge became how do we find a way of um, bringing the issue of climate change, which, as we all know, has become very polarized and typically associated with the left um, in general, to that audience. And so we ended up. Um, you know, our team in Poland and um, um, got quite deep into, you know, Polish Catholic culture and politics. And we found a bunch of 
um, um, leaders of the church who really cared about climate change. And um, over time, through a whole bunch of different work, we had consultations, we had meetings, we had seminaries over a number of months. We figured out a set of messages and an approach that we thought had a real shot in Poland. And the backbone of that approach, unsurprisingly, was what we figured out when we started speaking to people was they didn't really like Pope Francis, right? Um, but there was one Pope that they really loved, um, John Paul II, right? And so this was, he was obviously the touchstone for everything in, for, for Polish Catholics. So we developed a campaign and an approach that was grounded in the scriptures of John Paul II where people who were deep with him and who knew him personally um, were able to speak to and link his own teachings to climate change. And we actually created a series of different um, uh, organizations and movements. And there was a particular organization we created, which is essentially the first real Polish Catholic climate organization. And um, through a whole bunch of work um, over, a number of, um, over a number of years in the lead up to the, um, to the COP, we slowly but surely built an infrastructure um, um, of campaigning on climate that looked nothing like um, the, uh, the typical environmental movement. And by the time we got to the COP, we had a really amazing um, and remarkable set of outcomes. So in the week of the COP, we had um, 2 million prayer cards that were distributed to um, people in churches in Poland. We had hundreds of... Um, um, priests give sermons about climate change. Um, uh, we had a whole bunch of um, political leaders and bishops um, really come out in support um, of action on climate and a whole bunch of media um, that kind of supported this in the conservative press in Poland. Um, and most strikingly, the Polish um, enterprise and environment minister, who was the sort of key minister in the COP, Get up, got up and gave a speech um, in which she said, we cannot see the issue of climate change to the left. Um, she declared herself a champion of conservative environmentalism, which was the frame that we landed in the, um, in the seminaries that we'd sort of helped to set up in Poland that had been led by this movement, in which she'd taken that frame um, and really adopted it. And interestingly, we actually did take her to actually meet the, the current Pope, Pope Francis, and help her get religion around climate change that way as well. Um, and so, you know, the legacy of that work is that, you know, Poland is still a really, really difficult place to do work on climate, but this, the tides have shifted in Poland. Um, and so now a number of the opposition parties in Poland, including the party represented by um, Donald Tusk, which is one of the key opposition parties, um, you know, has adopted a full coal transition policy. Um, and at the time of the COP in 2018, you know, we got a much less hostile and more pro-climate posture than we could have done. So I think the, the, the lessons to abstract from that work um, are really, you've got to go to the uncomfortable places, to the places that may not be the places where the traditional environmental movement is. You have to ground that in the worldview, the frame, the ideas, that those people inhabit. And then you have to invest in infrastructure. And it's not a one-shot deal. You know, one stunt's not going to do it. One cute video is not going to do it. And so what you're really creating, what so much of our work creates, is infrastructure where people can then stay in that work, um, wait for the next big moment and opportunity, um, um, be there day in and day out. So, you know, today our work in Poland is really focused on um, rural women who are the backbone of the Law and Justice Party's political support base. And we've recently been running this really interesting campaign that turns rural women into the spokespeople. So it's not quite the scientists for Team Halo, but in this case, it's rural women and, and, and the uh, farmers and the wives of farmers speaking about climate um, because those are the people that the Law and Justice Party really listens to. Um, okay, I want to tell you one more story. This is a story from India. And this story is um, uh, about reframing the issue of climate change. So in India, if you run campaigns on climate change, as many of the environmental NGOs were doing, um, you tend not to get like that much traction, right? Um, because people are really focused on other things. They're focused on electrification. They're focused on getting out of poverty. Um, it's not an issue that in the traditional frames that you run climate campaigns um, really works. 
What we did find, though, was that when President Obama visited Delhi in 2015, for the first time, there was this moment created where he had basically, it was so polluted, it was a sort of a national shame where it was so polluted that, like, it was a scandal, he couldn't even attend certain events, um, you know, every November, December in Delhi, it becomes so dirty that people can't even often send their kids to school, it's so unsafe. So there was a window then in that 2015, late 2015 moment, and we sort of jumped on that window and we said, okay, what if we could, we had a team in India, we were like, what if we could use this as an opportunity, because there was suddenly all this focus um, on um, air quality, which hadn't really been um, done before. What if we could use this as an opportunity to realign um, um, the dynamic in India? And that was particularly important because the environmental movement in India had been basically shut down, right? Modi, you know, had shut most of those NGOs down effectively or silenced them. So we needed to bring new actors to the table. So we launched a, a campaign initially called Help Delhi Breathe. And Help Delhi Breathe um, was all about centering climate change, not as an environmental issue. In fact, we never used the word climate change at all, but as a um, public health issue that was about kids, um, and parents and getting people to be safe um, in their everyday lives. And what we did is we built a coalition of uh, the health sector, of educators, of business, uh, and we put them together with the activists and um, realigned the issue. So there were many, many manifestations of this campaign. There were some interesting ones. We trained rickshaw drivers, who are, of course, very important in Delhi, to talk to their, um, to talk to their passengers about air pollution. We ran a massive social media campaign. We did lots of really interesting work with um, um, spokespeople like the, the, the lung doctor um, at, um, at the leading Delhi hospital. And then outside that hospital, we created this installation, um, which sort of embodied the campaign where, where basically um, we put these artificial lungs up and um, within 24 hours, those lungs were dirty with soot. And that became an iconic photograph of like, look what happened to these huge lungs and look, showing how quickly those lungs filled with soup. Um, and um, the, the impact of the campaign was quite quick and quite significant. When we approached the Delhi government with the campaign before we launched it, we got like a shutdown. But um, after the campaign was launched and it created this real moment, you know, there was this um, very different posture. One of our big demands was that the Delhi government, as you can see in this um, in this uh, poster, in this billboard, the Delhi government actually start um, being transparent about air quality levels so that it actually have um, meters all over the city declaring what the level of pollution was. Um, and they agreed to do that. And then there were a set of other comprehensive demands around renewable energy, around electrifying the buses. Um, and we got some of the most ambitious, this coalition, got some of the most ambitious commitments um, ever in India to, toward renewable energy. Off the back of this new alignment of interests, this reframing of the issue um, that really helped to um, move the needle and that took all of these different, um, all of these different amazing forms. So one of the things that I think is really exciting about this campaign is it turned out to be really applicable and replicable in other places. So we took the basic model and adapted it. And now there are these um, clean air campaigns being run all over the world. There was even a philanthropic fund created called the Clean Air Fund. Um, there's a $100 million fund to do this kind of work. Um, and now that's happening all over the world. Back in Poland, you know, we brought some of that work to Poland. Um, this is in Putney in the UK. Um, some of the uh, the same thinking and work and uh, coalitions and alignments of people around um, this framing of the issue of climate change. So um, those are some examples. I'm going to stop there and we're going to launch into a Q&A. Thank you, Jeremy. It's just so exciting to hear all the work you've been doing and to get a bit of an update. Um, 
I'm sure we'll have loads of questions, but I'm just going to hog the floor for a little bit because uh, I can uh, and ask you some of my own. And um, and I'm not going to dive into where Oxford fits on the Harvard <laughs> Business School two by two. It's deeply surprising. Um, but I'm very interested in because at the Smith School of Enterprise and the Environment, we, of course, spend an awful lot of our time engaging with some of those constituencies that you listed up there that actually are the key ones to engage with, it's with business and with parts of the economy, the financial sector, and, and these are key um, actors in the transition to a net zero future. They're, they're at the coalface uh, uh, of change. Uh, and I just wonder, given what you've learned about targeting these specific cohorts, these specific communities in the right way, what are the messages that are working with business in particular, whether in America or around the world? And then perhaps after that, we'll come on to what are the messages that are actually working, uh, that actually give the right of center po politicians, not just a belief in the message, but actually help them to make political headway against the left. Mm. Well, <laughs> it's a great question, Cap. I mean, I think the first thing I'd say is that, um, not just on climate, but on lots of issues, the thing that seems to be most motivating to business is their own employee base, right? Less the consumers, less kind of amorphous political pressure, more retaining talent, attracting talent, right? And this was particularly true in the US last year over Black Lives Matter, but it's also true of climate. So I think there's a correct perception, and this applies more to the professional class, right? Um, that if we don't show we're serious on this stuff, um, people won't want to work here um, and it won't be a place uh, where value. So that argument and organizing workers um, um, to apply pressure, you're seeing this a lot with tech companies that are particularly um, vulnerable to that. They're all fighting over talent and, you know, those guys all um, need to be seen as very serious on this. So on the one hand, that's positive. I think in terms of the messages that resonate for, you know, for business, you know, I actually think some of the moral arguments are quite helpful for business as well, um, because the people who lead businesses, particularly the leaders of, of businesses in, in the West, tend to be like people who are quite susceptible to some of the not quite progressive activist arguments, but some of the more left of center arguments about your kids, about your moral responsibility, um, to future generations. So targeting corporate leaders as human beings can be quite helpful, um, both in terms of the carrot of saying, think about how you could be a hero, and also the stick of the stigmatization of being a bad actor and showing that there might be some social penalties for, for, for doing that. We're still a long way from treating fossil fuel executives like tobacco company executives. And I think that would be um, that's a legitimate strategy. You could debate whether it's a good or a bad idea, right? But um, but that that question of do we stigmatize the the um, the leaders of those corporations is an interesting one. Very interesting question. Certainly, uh, yeah, I'm I'm not quite sure what I think about that. But let, let me move on to part two, which is how do we make political gains for the right because as i said it's one thing to persuade those on the right of center that this is an issue they should care about it's another thing to say actually this is in your political interest you can get voted in if you take a particular you know view on climate on environmental issues mm. i've not spent a lot of my career helping think about how to elect right-wing governments so in, in that sense um but i do think that um the environment is a really clever and important wedge issue um you know you could argue that even the in the uk there's mm. some of that happening now right which is so different to the us where it's so kind of polarized in this very clean tribal way right mm -hmm. like for climate, Democrat, anti-climate, Republican. Here there's a lot more nuance. And um, I think this combination of kind of populism, localism um, uh, is one way to do it. So really local, right? Like green jobs, clean jobs, right here in Britain, right here there is a message that resonates with right-wing voters um, for sure. And also, you know, the more stewardship nature stuff mm -hmm. like farmers, We've done a lot of work mobilizing farmers over time. Farmers as a whole tend to be a relatively conservative um, voting block. But if you talk to them about, you know, kind of, again, localism, responsibility to protect the land, 
um, tradition, notions of tradition are really powerful. So because it's, you know, stewardship of the environment is, is, is a form of tradition, particularly as a farmer, that can be very effective. So I'd love to ask you one more, but I see there are 37 items in the chat function. So there's quite a few questions to get to online. Before I move online, um, let me just scan the room. Yeah, we've got a hand. I'm blinded by the light here, but up, up the back there. Thanks, Alex and, and Eric up the front here. Thanks a lot, Jeremy, to start with. Um, I want to go back to your Poland example, and I'm going to build up on what Cameron was saying on what messages were for what people. In the example of Poland, we know that I think over the last couple of years, there's a lot of energy intensive industries that moved from Western Europe to Eastern Europe and countries like Poland and Hungary also created those like policy incentives to have, the, have those industries um, installed in those countries, right? And they are not necessarily clean industries. I'm talking about, let's say, manufacturing, automotive, etc. So, of course, perception and awareness on climate change is very important, but at the same time, I think those people that we were talking about in that list that, you know, you had, like conservatives, etc., they might also have underlying fears around, like, their jobs that might be on thread because they're working in a dirty industry. So I'm wondering with your work, how much of those underlying, perhaps, fears are you trying to tackle beyond the general awareness on climate change, which I actually think that is going to help, you know, create action? That's yeah, a great question. So I think I understood the question, and, and I think you know addressing people's, particularly their economic fears, is absolutely crucial, right? And um, a lot of the most effective work being done now is going to you know uh, what is the positive narrative around economic transition and around just transition. And if you don't tackle that head on, you can't really you can't win, particularly some of the voters. If you if you're ever trying to get to any of the voters in the United States, for example, who voted for Donald Trump. You know, a, a big section of those voters, not all of them, but a big section of those voters are, you know, motivated by um, concerns about changes in the structure of the economy, right, which is why Trump ran so hard on things like fracking, um, um, accusing Biden of being anti-fracking and, you know, and, and the coal industry in the last election. So, yeah, I mean, I think you have to, I think the answer is positive narratives, probably not talking a lot about climate. There are good examples of politicians who are running um, particularly at like more of the local level, really effective governments campaigns where they're just beating the drum on the jobs that are coming from this transition. Um, and so relating it to people's lives and improving people's lives um, is the building block of so much of this uh, campaigning, I think. Great. Um, now I've got a question right up the front, Eric. Yeah. Thanks very much. And then Kai, I'm going to come to you for some online questions up there, Eric. Thanks, I'm Eric Beinhacker. Jeremy, good to see you in person. Yeah. <laughs> um, and terrific talk. Um, I was quite taken by your point on intensity. Um, and yeah, the psychologists tell us that um, uh, moral arguments tend to elicit some of our most intense emotions and engagement. And you know, when you look at the successful movements, they all have very strong moral narratives. You know, Black Lives Matter, Me Too. You know, uh, even, even you could say Trump's MAGA movement has been fueled by you know a, a moral argument. Mm. Um, in climate, we've almost deliberately drained it of moral arguments mm. on, on the environmental side. We've used, um, you know, climate change is bad for you, the green economy is good for you, sort of trying to appeal to some sense of rational self-interest and in, in these more technocratic arguments. So if we kind of shot ourselves in the foot in a way and in, in, in almost reducing the intensity uh, rather than raising it up, and have you seen um, that changing and seen successful moral narratives starting to get purchased? Mm. Yeah, well, I mean, look, um, I, I agree with you. I mean, clearly one of the big problems is the, the hyper rationality of the, of the movement in general, right? Um, it's a balance, right? So there are, like, for some interests, like business, you know, you, you, there is a rational argument. It's got, you've got to make the it's good for business argument. But as I said earlier, I think the moral argument for business also works really well. I think, in, you know, I think in, in general, we need um, the, the sort of, the, you need moral arguments that tap into something else happening in the culture that really matters. So for example, in the US, like when there was a huge racial justice movement um, that sprung up, the climate movement shouldn't just sit there and be like, oh, that's another issue. They should think what's the adjacency that connects climate to this thing that's happening in the culture. So that's one part of it, I think. 
right? And then the second thing I'd say is I think some of the work that the youth climate movement has done is a good example of intergenerational justice demands. So I think what you were alluding to with the MAGA movement, part of that was about fairness, right? It was about we are being treated differently to these other people who are getting all the benefits, the immigrants, you know, all of that were lies, but that narrative was about justice and fairness and treatment of others. And that is like something that I think has been quite effective in the kind of youth climate movement of the last few years has been that sense of outrage grounded in an argument about generational um, justice. And that's quite sticky um, and it has you know quite a lot of moral, um, quite a lot of moral force. The, the one the only qualification I'll give to that is to say that there is a lot of research in climate messaging, as you would know, that suggests that just talking about the problem and how bad the problem is doesn't work well. So it's like getting the balance right between the moral arguments and the pointing people to the solutions that they believe that feel plausible and available to them. You have to kind of get those two things right, because if you just make the moral argument, but you don't make the argument that this is a solvable problem, um, people tend to become demotivated. Which, of course, wonderfully, the science suggests that this is thoroughly solvable. It is uh, hard, yeah. but totally solvable. But let's move online now. So, Alex, would you mind bringing the mic forwards to Kaya? Oh, you've got it already. Brilliant. Well done. Just fantastically organized. Hi, thank you so much for being here. Our chat has been active, and our first three questions from the chat are about COP26, which, of course, is very present for us here in the UK. The first one is, hopefully you can answer quickly as the most influential Australian. Would you please persuade Scott Morrison to attend COP26? The second question on COP is, how can we best deal with the online rise of climate change denial in the UK, especially as energy prices rise and COP controversies surrounding Boris's leadership have increased? And the third question related to COP is, what can students do at or around this COP to tap into new power? Are you planning anything or are you aware of new power efforts that are that we should get involved in? What's the second question? I missed the second question, sorry. Uh, how can we deal with uh, anti-environmental backlash with energy prices rising in the UK? Right. Um, really, all really good questions. I can't help with Scott Morrison, unfortunately. I, I live in New York. Um, but, um, but, um, but I was having this conversation earlier with, with Tim. I mean, you know, one of the things that one of the lessons from Australia is um, politicians need to build climate policies and support that outlive an individual government. And so the failure of the Australian context is that there's now no real climate policy in Australia and nothing has stuck because everybody was like, just, you know, the Labor Party would do one thing and then they would get sort of shut down. And so basically there's, there's a lack of, of any foundation. So depoliticizing uh, as much as possible climate um, so that as it's happened in the UK, you do actually have a bit more of a foundation because both conservative governments and Labor governments have been tackling the problem. Um, you know, we can argue how well, but there's been at least engagement on the problem. Um, whereas in Australia, a bit like the US, it's become a little, it's a little bit more sharply polarized um, and that's led to, um, to almost no action. So politicians, when they're doing work on climate, we also need to push them to, to create things that are sustainable and likely to survive one term of office or a change of government, um, I think is an important lesson from the Australian context. Um, you know, I think on the, on the fuel prices thing, you know, yeah, I mean, the, the, the lesson on the Boris stuff, again, I'm not that close to UK politics because I, I live in the US, but it seems to me like he's being really brazen about the, the sort of like, you know, the sky is green, you know, whatever, like suddenly he's saying that the fuel price increases and all these other transitional things are like the price of a high wage economy and all of the different the arguments that are being that are being made. Um, you know, I think that the challenge for ad advocates is reframing the issue and decoupling, them, right? Um, but don't try to like fight, like what Boris is doing is basically just completely rearranging the debate. And perhaps that's the right direction for, for climate advocates. In terms of the COP, what I would say is the COP's really important, but don't put all your eggs in the COP basket because we should not, especially with a new power lens on, we should not like think of the COP as the place where that is the be all and the end all for action on climate. Regardless of what happens at the COP, we need to like 
push on. We cannot let what happened in Copenhagen happen in Glasgow where you know the balloon was punctured from the climate movement and there was years of demotivation and much slower action so my recommendation is yes there's many you know there's many things you can do to you know try to make that a big moment to pressure your national government get involved in an environmental organization that you think is doing strategic work um, on the cop but i actually don't think we should be investing too much of our emotional um, energy in the outcome of the cop um, because I don't think that's um, I don't think that's even necessarily what's going to really shape um, the long term outcomes here. I would just say for those of you interested in this particular question, we have a Scotia Group event moderated by Polita Clark from the Financial Times on the twenty first of October discussing do we need another COP. Uh, so do tune in, ping the Smith School team if you want to know more. Now, I think we've got time for two more quick rounds of questions, one in the room and one online. All the hands rock it up. So let's right next to where you are, Alex. I think you're the fastest hand. Thank you. Um, we've seen recently a rise in a lot of businesses publishing these big sustainability campaigns or promises, but not a lot in terms of how they're going to measure it or how they're going to share it. Um, I was wondering what your opinion on was how we could motivate these new powers to actually hold corporations accountable um, to, you know, more than shareholders. Great question. So new power holding corporations to account. We have one. Um, there we go. That's good. Grace. Hi. Hi again, Darmy. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, my question is actually just bringing up that Facebook um, example that you had. This idea that it starts off with a new power model and then locked in kind of old power so how do we fight new power with new power as opposed to relying on old power methods such as regulation laws when it comes to things like privacy concerns oh. um, addiction and young people um, and other misinformation issues with social media great question so can new power fight new power and we have last one from the room yeah up the front here thanks alex sorry to bunch you into three just making sure we get as many in as possible so new power holding corporations to account there actually is a nice theme there new power versus new power there um my question thank you jeremy for that talk um my question is uh, about how new is new power um if uh, we think about the civil rights movement anti-colonial movements they've all uh, used um some of the tools that uh the Me Too movement and uh, other movements have uh, used um is technology the only difference between what happened in the 50s and the 60s um or do we have other differences that we can learn from super questions off you go that's a really really <laughs> meaty quite challenging i should have not come to oxford i should have come somewhere it's, it's less intellectually you demanding come, yeah, yeah. Um, See, Jeremy didn't quite make it. Yeah, yeah exactly. Went to exactly. Harvard and then tried a real university. <laughs> um, so um, I think your first question is a really good one. I think the 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 structural problem right now is that um, the bar is still pretty low for business, and so what has happened in a lot of contexts is that you you have to you can create the scaffolding of having taken action on climate, and a good example would be if you set a net zero target that is fifteen years out right as a lot of companies have or 20 years out or whatever you know look these ceos all know that they're not going to be ceo in 20 years right the average tenure of a ceo is four or five years now so um it's, and that's true of politicians too right we're doing some work at the moment on climate and cities where we're trying to get mayors to make commitments in a two three year time horizon because they're all making these 2050 2030 whatever and that's totally irrelevant and so therefore they're completely off the hook so i think one thing is about you know um is is there is a real structural problem which is that you can create the impression you're doing stuff there's rhetoric there's commitments there's scaffolding and not do enough so i do think that's a, a there is a real role for campaigning part of the challenges we were talking about earlier today with cameron and his um and, and his group was that we don't have great ways necessarily to measure and hold accountable right um corporates on what they're on what they're doing so we need to get the measurement right so we can say you're off track you made this 2025 commitment but you're you're not going to meet it um and frankly i think we we need to actually we do actually need to get um we need to get more aggressive in our campaigning approach um, because there are lots of companies that will respond to that pressure with more ambitious um, approaches. The final thing I'll say is employee activism is key. 
in a lot of these big um, these big companies. So activate the employees because they're going to be more effective than general outside pressure. So that's question so one. So then, on, do we need old power to take down Facebook new power, or can we take down new power with new power? You know, my short answer on that is unfortunately, I think we need a lot of old power. For, for that, like we do need to regulate the platforms. We need old fashioned antitrust. Um, in my view, we need to break up the platforms. We need, um, there's a set of things we need to do. We need to regulate the algorithms and apply a kind of public interest test to those. Um, and this, we talk about some of this in our, in our book. So most of, I think the solution space is still in regulation. That said, you know, the thing about new power models is that they live and die by their, by their users. So, you know, there, were, there have been some examples of kind of desertion of these platforms. After Trump was elected, there was a delete Uber movement. That movement was not that long lasting, but it actually had a big influence on Uber. Um, and it did change their trajectory on a number of issues and it put, pulled them way away from some, some, some things. So, you know, user driven activism can be really important. Um, um, if they think they're going to lose their users, they will respond differently. It's hard to do that at the scale required on Facebook because we are all their users and there are, you know, billions and billions of us. And it's not going to be as easy to make a dent as it would be with a smaller platform. Um, so the short answer, unfortunately, is I think this is this is more of an old power play. Um, um, but yeah, it's an interesting, it's a really interesting question. What was the third question? Um, I'd love to follow that up later, oh, perhaps. No, but no. It's, is, yeah. is new power new? Yes and no. So I think you're absolutely right. Like the, our argument, as we say, uh, you know, in our book, the the, the argument is not um, movements are new. There's nothing new about that. There's been organizing from day one. Really, our work is about describing the particularity of how this plays out in the 21st century. And I think what is different is that the scale, the speed, the density of participation is so much bigger that it enables things that were not possible at all um, before. So that's particularly true in things like business. So I mean, just to give one really simple example. You know, Airbnb, right, is a new power model based on, you know, helping people to find temporary accommodation. Um, there used to be in the, you know, in pre-internet, you used to be able to get a, a, a kind of, um, uh, a, you know, every year you'd get like a catalogue and you could like do a house swap with somebody. You'd find a house and you could rent or, or swap a house with someone else. But when you did it through Airbnb, it created such incredible density, speed, efficiency that like real estate markets in key cities were completely disrupted. And I think the same is true of um, politics. So the speed and scale with which you can organize is changing. Um, there has a, a bunch of characteristics that I think are worth not just seeing as the exact same thing, but like studying and understanding. Um, but it's a good question. New power is a, is a is a catchphrase rather than something that's designed to imply that um, everything under the sun is new. So we've got four minutes left. We're going to hear three questions online, but I think you're just going to pick one of them to answer. So just to put you on the spot. So kind of awful. Okay, I'll make it easier. I'll give you two. So um, the first one is, do you have any experience working in China, which is obviously a major player? Uh, China doesn't fit neatly into either right or left, new or old power. And the second question actually coming from me because I can and there's no more online questions. Um, you've spoken a lot about the distinction between uh, new power and old power, but new power requires a lot of old power money. To what extent is new power just old Old, is, what extent is what you call new power, old power in sheep's clothing? Mm, and that was your question? That's my question. So I clearly have to answer your question. No, you can answer <laughs> another one. No, if, you've, if you've been to China. You <laughs> probably <laughs> damage should just do both. Exactly. Um, yeah, uh, I think uh, on the second question, you know, really, these are, this is not like a binary, but so much of our work is about the intersection of old and new and the combination of them. So, yeah, I mean, purpose itself is an example of that right we a lot of our work is funded by large philanthropies you know um those you could you know i think most effectively describe those as old power but that's enabling us to do a bunch of things that that are in service of some of these new power tools so that's a kind of necessary condition uh, at the moment of a lot of activity um that may change over time right and there's so much more crowdfunding of things etc um, you know, your question on China, China is not a place that we've done a lot of work because it's just not an environment that an organization like Purpose can really exist in. Um, so that's the, that's the, the short answer. 
Um, I do think China is an interesting example in the ways that they have used um, elements of new power, right, um, as, as a, and built that into their strategy, right? There's a lot of participation happening in China in many arenas, the consumer arena, the cultural arena. There's just a particular arena in which participation is heavily limited, and that is the political arena. But I think the trade that they've made with the population on that is kind of fascinating because it's very different to like the North Korean model. The North Korean model is just like, you put a lid on everything, right? And um, all aspects of life are kind of, um, you know, regulated and, 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 and repressed. That's not exactly the Chinese model. It's more complicated than that. Well, look, that was wonderful. So many insights in 90 minutes, um, not least where does Oxford sit in the two by two? And actually, I think, as you pointed out, like so many things, it's more complex than just thinking of these things in a binary uh, way. We have a highly decentralized, chaotic, inclusive, transparent uh, model here that people can't understand. So we're definitely old power in many ways, but new in others. And I guess, as you say, it's this blend of old and new where the action happens and our role here is to shine a light on these issues and to educate we've done more downloading perhaps than uploading this evening, but I hope, like me, you will agree that it has been immensely insightful so thank you very much Jeremy we're looking forward to having you back. Hope to see you. Thank, you. thank you for having me. Um, please do keep tuning in to Oxford Mountain School events, jump onto the website, and of course we have a lot coming up at the Smith School as well. Thank you.